Yeah, I'm really glad to uh, welcome all of you here in this uh, panel organized by the Institute of uh, Environmental Justice. I'm Dorothy Baldenhofer, and I will be the moderator for this uh, panel tonight. Um, we are recording the panel, so if you don't want to appear on the screen, um, leave your camera off. Uh, we will publish this webinar afterwards also on the YouTube channel of the Institute. So if you want to send it to some friends uh, who might be interested in the topic, feel free to share it with them. Um, yeah, today we will talk about the uh, about climate justice and why it is so important that um, the Global South uh, is involved in the discussion um, because the climate crisis affects us all, but it does not affect us all equally. And um, while the countries that have contributed most to it um, and are still contributing to it, are dominating the negotiations to address it. And the regions and populations that are most affected by the climate crisis um, are underrepresented in the forums or have uh, little uh, negotiation power. So today we have uh, three uh, experts uh, on this panel with whom we will discuss the reasons and mechanisms behind this. And uh, we will talk about how we ensure that the global South's demands are not only listened uh, to, but also implemented. And um, yeah, I'm really pleased that today we are able to have this panel together. Um, firstly, with uh, Peter Emorinkin Donatus. Uh, he was born in Nigeria and has lived in Germany for over three decades. Um, he is a freelance journalist, educator, facilitator, and environmental rights activist. He uh, is co-founder of Payday Africa Movement and one of the spokespersons of the African Black community in Germany and the Committee for an African Monument in Berlin. He is also co-founder and spokesperson of the movement Bündnis Ökozidgesetz, or in English, Ecocide Law Alliance, which was founded with the aim of criminalizing ecocide. Um, so the most um, yeah, tremendous environmental crimes. So um, this initiative aims um, to making companies and countries accountable for ecocides um, and these to be recognized as crime, crimes against peace. Um, and to get together with some experts from the Global South living in Germany, he recently co-founded also a new BIPOC think tank called Care and Repair Decolon Decolonial Think Tank for Environmental Justice. So welcome, Peter, here on the panel. Uh, I'm really glad you're here. Um, Thank you. Then we have Sheena Anderson. She's an intersectional environmentalist and activist with the Black Earth Collective. Um, this is a Berlin-based BIPOC, BIPOC uh, climate collective. She's also project manager at the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy with a specific focus on Black and intersectional feminism, anti-racism, and whiteness in foreign policy, as well as climate justice. She holds a master's degree in peace research and international politics, and she has also worked for the Center for Political Education in Baden-Württemberg in the Department for Prevention of Extremism. And um, yeah, really glad to have you here as well, Sheena. And last but not least, we have Juan Pablo Gutierrez here with us. Um, he's a human rights defender specialized in indigenous people's rights activist and international delegate of the National Indigenous Organization uh, of Colombia, ONIC, and the Yupa Indigenous People. He has been working since 2019 in the visibility and denouncing of the human, humanitarian situation of indigenous peoples from Colombia, working in coordination with the local communities and their repre representative uh, organizations. Because of his work denouncing the humanitarian situation of these people, Juan Pablo was catalogued as a military target by paramilitary groups that forced him to exile abroad from where he currently works now. So um, uh, Juan Pablo is now also in Europe. Uh, currently, he focuses most of his work on the fight against climate change 
through strategic alliances between indigenous peoples and environmental activists in order to consolidate what uh, he calls the globalization of resistance in protection of Mother Earth. Um, well, thank you for being here, Juan Pablo, for making it. Um, it's really nice to have all of you three here with us um, and discussing the topic. Um, so actually, my first question uh, would be for uh, Juan Pablo. Um, could you give us um, your perspective as an indigenous um, person from Colombia, what, how do you perceive the climate crisis? What does it mean to you? Um, yeah, could you talk a bit about this? Okay, do you hear me? Okay, perfect. Uh, first of all, uh, apologize uh, for my English because it's the first time I make a um, a speech or a presentation in that language. Um, about uh, the topic uh, uh, you asked me, there is something that I have always noticed. And this is something that I have always realized in many contexts, both in the environmental context, as well as in the activist context, NGOs, etc that people always talk about the climate crisis and the global warming. And those two terms are used to mean a threat, the, the, the greatest threat that we have ever had as humanity, uh, given to the potentiality of uh, this climate crisis, which nothing more and nothing less can be the, can signify the, the, the extinction of, uh, of all, all us as human family. The, those two terms, climate crisis and global warming, have become triva trivialized and are practically trendy. From my point of view, people repeat them, relating them to the enemy that we have to fight today if we want to survive uh, as human space species. However, the way in which the climate crisis is being represented now is a serious mistake and a serious problem from my point of view, because it's been considered as something consubstantial, consubstantial, sorry, as if it were something autonomous or something immanent, something independent of any externality. The climate crisis is being thought of, uh, of a threat by itself and not as the consequence of something. And this is where a big mistake is being committed and therefore the solution are being taken in the same way. Because in reality, from my point of view, the climate crisis and the global warming are the result of something, the result of a model of society create, created here in Europe and defended until today in the name of something that we have called the progress. And we don't have to forget that word, the progress. So that climate crisis is the result of the modern Europe, European model of society, which in the name of that progress for more, than, for more than five centuries has modified the natural order of the cosmos and changed the universal law, laws in the name, uh, uh, sorry, the universal laws of life in, in, in the planet where we live. By, by this, I mean that the European men of modernity supported and justified by the theories of the thinkers of the no he's gone um maybe we we'll wait one second if he comes back
or otherwise um, maybe um, <laughs> Peter you can um, go on explaining us a bit uh, my my question would have been um, after Juan Pablo's answer um, because he was talking about this Eurocentric view on on the climate crisis and um, how, and also the colonial yeah background this has um, how would you say can we break these colonial power structures that are still at work here and do you even think that it is possible to break them and if yes how big question <laughs> yes <laughs> That's a gigantic one. Anyway, uh, first of all, uh, decolonization can be understood in the context of uh, a, pro a process of both uh, internal and external reparations, uh, reparation to repair. Uh, yes, to repair damages caused by centuries long uh, exploitations and social economic disenfranchisement of uh, peoples around the globe uh, by Europe, you know, most especially, you know, and uh, <clears throat> if we want to understand um, the process of uh, decolonization properly, we also need to go into uh, the 534 years of, of our experience, the African experience and um, and that uh, would blow off uh, blow this whole scope. And so I feel that um, what I think that decolonization itself uh, is an affront, you know, against uh, the core European identity. It's, that's that, that's very, it's very important to understand that. And um, not only uh, European identity, also white supremacy. And um, uh, this makes it extremely difficult, you know, uh, for uh, European governments and societies uh, uh, to critically question uh, their roles and responsibilities, you know, uh, for the past and the present. Well, this also uh, impedes processes, corrective processes, Transform, transformative pr processes. But directly, if I want to answer your question directly, I would say that, um, yes, it is possible to break colonial power structures, but a lot need to be done. And, and to be very frank with you, we have been making huge, even when it's been very slow, but we, we are making huge progress. And, um, we are unable to consume or uh, let me even want to say recognize or acknowledge that we are making some progress. When I mean we, I'm talking about Global South. And um, because I live in this country now for about 30 years, more than 30 years, my first experience with the white way of life. And uh, if I compare uh, now the process of uh, more than three decades of activism in this country and uh, my campaign was to decolonize the societies and the structures and environmental justice, compared to now, I think we have made uh, very big steps in the right direction. And I want to consume that. You know, I want to be able to, you know, uh, do this to myself uh, because um, we've been sidelined, we've been discriminated against racially, we've been um, kind of uh, declared threat to the society because we stand to say we have the right to live too. So this decolonization process has been going on for a long time. And uh, more than two years ago, the brother in America was uh, murdered and uh, George Floyd. And uh, in 
that actually gave it a lot of energy. And uh, since almost two and a half years ago now, we are into a different dimension. So now we are talking about the radicalization, the radicalization of decolonization. When we say radicalization, we are not talking about violence and uh, and whatever, you know, but we need to be radical about our approaches, about our solutions, because 534 years is pretty long time and there is no sign uh, of an end in sight. And, um, and we can no longer break. So I would say that we have uh, different concepts on how this decolonization can take place. And uh, I will not want to take so much time. I will wait uh, a little bit. I will be able to tell you one or two uh, solutions uh, towards uh, decolonization of the whole society, but particularly of the uh, environmental and so-called climate justice. Let me conclude, please by making it, trying to differentiate between, and that was what uh, Pablo was trying to also explain, to differentiate between environmental justice and climate justice. And uh, because uh, the climate is an integral of the environment, not the other way around. Therefore, um, climate justice, is an integral of environmental justice. Unfortunately, like what Pablo tried to portray, um, climate justice, which is a concept not from the global north or from the global south, um, uh, has, it has become a, a hype. And uh, we are happy that you are uh, kind of, uh, you find our concept very good. We are happy about the fact that you are taking over our concept. We don't have anything against that. But then you need, you cannot take over our concept and leave our perspectives aside because the perspectives are part and parcel of that concept. So don't Europeanize our concept. Don't bring in your Eurocentric perspectives and and, 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 and approaches and solutions into our concept. That will not be climate justice anymore because it's not your creation. I just wanted to put that straight to the round. Yes, thank you. Maybe also um, on that uh, point, a question for Sheena. Um, now that also the COP just finished, um, which is now, let's say um, the most um, yeah, important or at least the biggest um, uh, forum where the, the climate crisis is discussed. Um, yeah, what strategies do we have to use in the global north um, and in general to ensure that actors in the global south are heard at the negotiation table or at, that they get a seat at the negotiation table or do we just have to destroy the table and build new ones? Or what would you say, what do we need? Can we go on like this? Is there even a possibility that this will help? Um, yeah, big question. <laughs> Thank you. And I think there's different, or for me, there are different levels to that. Um, and I'm uh, glad Peter already mentioned and explained uh, radicalization and the more positive connotation of it. And if I would answer it in a more radical and simple way, I'd say no, we would need to destroy the table because obviously it cannot go on like that. Um, and all of the topics that were already discussed by uh, Juan Pablo and Peter um, including um, decolonize, like decolonizing this whole discourse and field actually, I think, plays into that 
But until we get there <laughs> um, and until we actually have a new table, I think there are certain strategies that um, not only can be taken, but actually must be taken because obviously it, yeah, we cannot, we cannot just go on as like business as usual, that, that won't work. Um, but I think before we take these strategies, if we say like, if we name it the global north, um, I think has to do some rethinking at first, what do these strategies actually mean for the very damaging and, um, and you know, damaging and actually hurtful way of life that Europe has enabled in Europe and 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 abroad. So um, it it cannot just be oh we you know include voices that actually don't need to be included. They have been there all along, you know. But maybe the global north just didn't want to see and listen. So I think that's that's important to see um, and really think or or really understand. Whatever strategies we apply, we cannot go on as we have before. So that means the way of life within Europe has to change fundamentally. The way that we lead and do discussions on um, environmental justice, on climate justice, and in that whole field need to change radically. So we cannot just apply strategies and keep on with our our uh, usual way of life. I think that's a very important first step before we implement uh, strategies. And I think one concrete strategy, I mean, obviously has to be rethinking um, the relationship with with the so-called global south and with people in the global south, uh, but also with global south people based in the global north and really think about histor uh, historical responsibility um, and, and colonial responsibility and how that has shaped uh, the climate discourse also within the global north. Um, another strategy because I hear like I often hear people say in the global north oh we need to you know like empower people and we need to include people and stuff like that but I think what we actually need to do is power sharing and actually take a step back because global north voices are not the voices that need to be heard in these spaces uh, so the really having a discussion like do like do we need to be there um and what does it mean to not only include but actually just be silent and shut up and take a step back i think that's super important um and also inclusion of voices is only one step but people also need to feel safe and feel heard and seen within spaces and um as we know with COP, but also other spaces, they are super toxic, they are super racist, they are super sexist and exclusionary. So um, it, it, I cannot just leave a very hurtful space in the same way and just say, oh, I include Global South voices, but I don't change anything else. So we need to create spaces where people actually can lead the discussions in the way that they want to. And that is helpful, really, and not just say, oh, we include voices, but we don't change anything else. So I think that's also um, very important. Um, and maybe one last strategy I think is also to rethink how how the colonial history of Europe um, has shaped the climate discourse in a way in a in the global north that even here um, uh, racialized voices are excluded, for example. So I think that's a big issue. And I think um, people like me, for example, born and raised in the global north, but also racialized, can have a very important role as there are obviously different um, positionings. Uh, and we come with a lot of privilege, but we also make certain experiences um, you know, like being oppressed also within our own countries. And I think that actually brings a set of knowledge that can be helpful within the space. But if like the global north has so much 
issues with accepting colonial history, you know, and how it how it continues to shape discourses. It excludes uh, global uh, global South voices, but it also excludes marginalized voices within the global North that I think can be helpful because if we look at how. Um, how the climate movement, for example, is structured and represented in the global north, it is not surprising that it seems as it is only white and only elite, because I think certain voices don't have a place there or don't feel welcome there. And if we rethink how we can also uh, use differentially positioned people in the global north and have better access uh, to the climate movement, I think that can be beneficial in the way that we discuss and maybe include a global South perspectives. Um, but um, that's a long way to go. <laughs> so yeah, but um, I think there are certain strategies. Um, but to conclude, the first step, I think, before we take these strategies is that there needs to be an understanding in the global north that we cannot continue. And it's not only about including others, but at first um, redefining how how the global north enters the, uh, these discussions, because right now it does it in a very toxic way. And yeah, that cannot continue. Thank you, Sheena. I think uh, Juan Pablo is back now, and maybe you want to finish um, yeah, your input, and maybe also you can um, go on answering the question why um, indigenous knowledge is fundamental to addressing the climate crisis. Yes, sorry. The, do you hear me? I have a technical problems, I'm sorry. Uh, I was talking about uh, the, the notion of progress, no? I was talking about how people are talking uh, uh, about uh, climate crisis and global warming um, as something uh, uh, autonomous or individual, but uh, people are not talking about uh, the, the reasons which are provoking the, the, the climate crisis. And I was talking about the, the notion of progress, which is from a point of view, the, the basis of the problem we are, we are in, in this time. I was telling that the climate crisis is the result of the modern, of the, of the modern European model of society, which in the name of that progress for more, for more than five centuries modified the natural order of the cosmos and altered the universal laws of life in the planet. And I wanted to say about that, that the European men of, of modernity, justified by the theories of, the, of all the thinkers of the Enlightenment and the Renaissance, uh, there to do two things that had never happened before in history, and that radically altered, changed the natural order existing, existing until, until that moment, until, until then. The first point, and I wanted to talk about that, is to position himself above nature, to have thought himself su superior to the mother earth, to begin to conceive the nature for the first time in history as an object to be infinitely exploited for the benefit of what we know today as progress. Progress, that supposed progress, that in the reality is the exploitation of Mother Earth without any clemency in order to preserve, to preserve, sorry, the market and the, cap and the capitalist system. This so-called progress is to say the exploitation of the nature has been the logic of the operation, has been the, the model, the, the horizon to follow and the epistemology that have governed the life of Europe for five centuries and is the basis of the climate crisis in which we find ourselves today. 
the foundation of this crisis is that the nature went from being the mother, the mother on which we depend structurally for, for living, as we had always believed, to begin a simple object that the European man thought he could dominate and exploit without, uh, without mercy. I don't know if we, if we say mercy in, in English. And that's proudly called in Europe the secularization of society in the name of reason. Or they also call that the disenchantment of the world, which is supposedly one of the greatest achievements of the modern man. But today we are in the living the worst threat that we have ever had in our in, in, in our lives uh, because of that. So that climate that climate crisis that we are currently experiencing is the proof of the failure of this notion of progress and, 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 and of having secularized and rationalized the most important thing in the world, which is the Mother Earth. That's why, from my point of view, it's essential to return, to come back to our roots as humanity. In other words, it's necessary to begin to re-enchant the world in the other sense of modernity. The second point to finish that from my point of view changed the natural logic and, and the universal order by the European people in the modernity has to do with how Europe materialized the progress that I taught before uh, that I have just explained. Because in order to be able to achieve this progress, to be able to exploit the mother earth for the benefit of the European people. Europe couldn't carry out that project only through the exploitation of the richest and the most abundant lands in the world, which are not the, Europe, the, the European lands, but the lands of the global south. In Europe, for the people who are not, who didn't know that, in Europe, there was nothing before modernity. That continent was sunk in the Middle Age, suffering from famines, diseases, burning women, etc. In other words, European progress would not have been possible without the colonization of the Southern countries, without the invasion without the theft, without the plunder and the subjugation of the lands of the global south and the populations. Because if there is one thing that is certain in that we, we don't have to forget is that without the American continent in the 16th century and without Africa in the 18th century, Europe will be surely sunk even today in the Middle Age. So the world to remember in this second point is colonization. In the first part was progress. In the second point is colonization. To understand, to talk about climate crisis, not as, as something individual or consubstantial, consubstantial but uh, as the result of something. And uh, now, how did Europe justify this colonization, this invasion, this robbery, this plunder of our lands in America and in Africa? But through the notion, through a notion that didn't exist until then, which was the notion of race, of racism. A notion that was conceived, structured and justified by the thinkers of the enlightenment and by science, through the justification of the presumed biological difference between some humans and some others. That justified the existence of some humans, of some human beings naturally and biologically superior to others. The race was, no, sorry, the race that was justified as superior was the European one, and the rest of the world 
would justify from the theories of the thinkers of enlightenment and from the modern science as, it, as the inferior race, the races that had to be civilized by the superior ones. In other words, it was the perfect, the perfect excuse to justify the unjustifiable, to justify European colonialism, to justify the violence the, in the exploitation until today. So if we, really, if we really want to move forward in solving this climate crisis and global warming, it seems to me fundamental that people understand that this climate crisis is the consequence of the meaning of that notion of progress invented, invented by the modern European men, which goes against the natural logic of life since it depends on the exploitation of mother of mother earth and it's a progress that has been possible until today only through colonialism and the exploitation of the lands and the people of global south this notion of modern progress is the antithesis of life because it's the exploitation of the mother earth and the exploitation of the people in the global south I am going to finish by that. That's why, from my point of view, it's not possible to think about solving the climate crisis if we don't understand the foundations of this modern society, which is the notion of progress, the first, po the first po point I talked about, founded on colonialism and the secularization of nature as an excuse to achieve it. The solution to this climate crisis must be to resignify this notion of progress to give it another content, a progress linked to the re-enchantment of the world, as I, as I said, and uh, in order to Europe to leave the colonialism behind and let the people from the global south and the territories live in peace one and for all. Thank you. Thank you, Juan Pablo. Um, now I would uh, go about a bit about more, um, yeah, an, an aspect of, of a solution, let's say, um, to achieve climate justice that is uh, intersectionality, uh, which Sheena, you have uh, worked a lot on. Um, why, why would you say is, uh, it is uh, or isn't possible to achieve climate justice um, without uh, intersectionality or having an intersectional view on it? Uh, sure. I, I just wasn't sure, Peter, if you had an immediate reaction to Gwen, uh, because it was well, okay. okay, amazing. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, to me, that's like, it's such an obvious thing. And I think to all of us here and, and spe specifically to all the speakers, but what I really find is um, there seems to be surprise sometimes um, when people are like, oh, what, like, why do we have to include that now as well? But um, the, the, if we want to call it the climate crisis is, is such an intersectional issue because obviously it doesn't affect people the same way. And we talked a lot about like uh, global north and global south and um, MAPA, for example. So uh or or yeah specific specifically vulnerable countries um but even within countries obviously there's there's a difference uh, how people are are targeted um uh and and a lot of people for example if we take if we take women uh, as as example a lot of people say oh women are most affected by climate crisis that's partially true because obviously, let's say a white woman in New York is not affected the same way as uh, an Afro-Indigenous woman in Brazil. So, um, and why is that? Because obviously an, an Afro-Indigenous woman in Brazil, on top of being targeted and uh, threatened um, by the, the climate crisis in a climate vulnerable country, uh, experiences 
racism, experiences sexism, experiences ex exclusion from uh, policy decision making. So obviously that's uh, that's an issue. So it's not quite correct if we just say, oh, women are more vulnerable uh, to the climate crisis. Yes, that's true because men historically had more decision making power, but still uh, we we need to to look at at the differences um and and that's uh, only one example i mean we can we th there's unfortunately there are so many uh, uh examples um uh, uh all, all over the world uh, of how people are differently um, uh, marginalized and targeted by the climate crisis. And if we look at how how and where the climate crisis hits, we see that um, people that within society are already uh, marginalized and vulnerable to other topics such as already named uh, racism, but also excluded um, from economic wealth, for example, and so on. Um, um, we see that when the climate crisis hits there, it increases already exist existing uh, vulnerabilities, which obviously is, is um, then even harder to get out of and to receive resources, for example, to adapt um, and so on. Um, so that's one example. And and I, I want to add, because what always, um, what really bothers me in in discussions within the global north is that people always act as if uh, the climate crisis is something that's so far away or also people for example indigenous people are people that are so far away but it's not true there's indigenous life in europe as well um and obviously even in global north societies we see that um uh, racialized people are the most affected there's so many numbers for the uh, us for example where black people are more targeted by the climate crisis also due to racist housing for example so uh, they are for to live in areas where the pollution is just really bad because they can't afford um, better housing. But we have similar situations in uh, the UK, for example, and even in Germany, where uh, we see that um, uh, Sinti and uh, Roma are specifically a target of environmental racism, for example. So it's obviously an issue and, and that I think kind of adds to what uh, Peter and Juan Pablo already said, because it's so important that we cannot just say, oh, we talk about the climate crisis now. There's so many more issues connected to that. If we target that, we need to talk about economic justice, about racial justice. We need to talk about food security, about housing. All of these topics play into that. Um, so it's such a complex topic and a complex topic needs intersectional solutions. Um, so, yeah, I'm, not, I'm actually not quite sure if I completely answered your question. But, um, yeah, I think uh, I think that's that's just um, uh, so important. And, and maybe one final note. Um, when we look at who is actually really leading this fight and who has been leading this fight, we often see that it's the so-called most marginalized. So we see that, um, uh, that, for example, a lot of Black women, Indigenous women, uh, feminist voices in the Global South, for example, and so on, are actually leading this fight for environmental justice. So the the for me, always the most phenomenal thing is that those most targeted and excluded are actually the solutions and the leaders within this fight. So showing such resistance um, within this fight, it's it's extraordinary. So it, I'm always astonished how in the global north, we cannot finally come to an understanding that obviously we need to listen to these voices uh, and amplify them. So I think that's that's just uh, very important. And we cannot talk about this topic without um, applying an intersectional lens, because if we do, um, then we won't get anywhere with the solutions. If we apply colorblind and, and non-intersectional solutions, we will not solve this at all. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I um, have a short uh, follow-up question, and then I will hand yes. you over the word, Peter. Um, so then, if you say that um, the solutions are with the most uh, in the most vulnerable communities, actually, how can now, um, yeah, for feminist foreign policy, for example, be a solution there? And how does it have to look like? So it's not top 
down? Yeah, it's, um, I think it's tricky because, I mean, obviously I, I work in this field, so I'm a fan of feminist foreign policy, but um, it has its limits. So I think feminist foreign policy can be a tool to actually lift um, climate and environmental justice in a way on the agenda that that we really approach it within foreign policy and that we see it um, as a security issue, not in the in a militarized understanding, but in an understanding that obviously it it affects people's security already in the here and now. Um, but we need to be very bold and very radical in the way how we apply feminist foreign policy. Then it cannot mean, oh, uh, let's include some more women on like decision making level and that's it. Um, so we really need to think of ways to structure foreign and security policy in a way that it um that it prioritizes uh, the the everyday life and the security of people who are already uh, threatened um, by the so-called climate crisis um, right now. Um, I think we see some positive development here, but it's very as like baby steps. <laughs> so there there can be a, or there has to be a lot more more done and and I think already here the key really is intersectionality. We cannot just include some more women in foreign and security policy decision making and that's it. Um so we need uh, global south uh, climate um, expertise. We need indigenous expertise. Uh, we need more feminist voices in these fields uh, from all over, actually. So um, I think we just have to be yeah, very bold and courageous in applying that concept. I think then it can work. Um, but uh, yeah, would also need to be very careful from like pinkwashing strategies and also um, yeah, just applying, you know, a name to something, call it feminist, and then think that's it. Um, I think that's not the solution. But uh, generally, I think feminist foreign policy can be a tool. Um, but we we really need to think of of bold ways um, to apply it. All right, thank you, um, Peter. I think you had still a comment on what Juan Pablo said. Oh, oh yes, uh, the comments became more and more. Uh, <laughs> the more I listen to such beautiful and fantastic uh, submissions, and um, uh, actually, I would uh, appeal to you to allow me at this stage to present to you what we feel should be uh, the solutions, and uh, because uh, we definitely know where we are coming from, we know where we are now, we just don't know where we're going. So, and, um, but I just wanted to make some few comments in respect to uh, Pablo and uh, Shina and uh, what they briefly, uh, beautifully presented. First of all, um, to uh, the brother uh, Pablo, I think that when you talk about progress, it's, it sounds, I know you don't mean that, you don't mean it that way, but it sounds to me as if there was no progress in Africa and South and uh, uh, other parts of South America and other parts of the world before um, the white people came to us. So, and uh, to be very frank with you, it, it's this pro so called progress, the white progress that uncivilized us. And um, the so-called white civilization. And that I wanted to put uh, across. And then the second point is, we still have to be very careful about um, the word indige indigenous people. Because when we use that those words, we always, you know, look at, South America, you know, and so on and so forth. And I'm an African. And if we say that Africa, it all began there. So why are we not calling us? Why, why are we not included in this 
catalog of indigenous peoples. Because we now, when we talk about indigenous people, we are always referring to people like my brother Pablo from uh, uh, Colombia or somebody from Ecuador or from uh, the Native Americans or wherever, but it all started in Africa. So where are we? I just wanted to point that out. This is a, a huge scientific debate, which we need to be uh, uh, tackled or taken on in the next few months and years to come. Then another point I want to say is also about this so-called feminist foreign policy. And the Germans, they frame it like feminist foreign policy based on uh, human rights values or European values or whatever. And um, of course, anything that sounds feminist I'm always out for that. You know, I'm always open for that. But where are the Ogoni women in this whole picture? Where are the Mapuche women in this whole picture? So when uh, the foreign minister is talking about this, I, do, I don't think she's talking about my mother now that she's, she's dead or my sister or uh, people from, from uh, women from Colombia, because if she really mean, if they really mean what, the, what they're saying about feminist foreign policies, they will not go off so long to, for instance, to start constructing a pipeline, a 7,000 kilometer pipeline all the way from Ogoni land, from Niger Delta, where the majority of people that live there are women. And there be the most people that feel the pain. So when they are talking about all these policies, they are not talking about us from the global south. It's all about you. This is, we have experiences about this. The French Revolution was all about you. You go to the schools today, you learn about that. It's something you glorify, it's part of your European achievement, you know, liberty and whatever. But we were enslaved at the, at the same time. We were colonized. We were deprived and disenfranchised from all kinds of rights at the same time. So it's all these things are not meant for us. So I do not really, with all, with all full respect, I disregard these policies because until my people start to feel that for the sake that we do not need to, you know, nobody wants to stay in the room during the winter when it's cold. So we need some heating system, we need gas and all the rest. But women are suffering most from the from this uh, neo-colonial extractivism in the Niger Delta, for instance, or in Kungulan or wherever, where we get all these raw materials from. Who is talking about them? I'm sure they are not talking about Africans, African women. I'm sure they are not talking about Mapuche women. When we talk about this feminist foreign policy, I just wanted to say that there's another point I wanted to say is that the reactions when we continue to say, call it a climate crisis, it's like downplaying the whole scenario. We do not have a climate crisis. We have a climate catastrophe, which is already in here with us. So, and what I think we have is an environmental crisis. So let's get back to that. We have serious environmental crisis because it is the destruction of the environment, the degradation of the environment that is the main cause of this climate change. So if we know that the main cause of this climate, so-called climate change is the destruction of the environment, then we need to do something about that. So why are we not doing something about that? Because we want to eat our cake and have it at the same time. I'm talking about the global north, you understand? 
So I am saying that from our perspective, I might be talking too long now, but I think it's very important. From our own perspective, we are, we are mixing up things. We need to follow a sequence. We need, first of all, the acknowledgement. If you do not acknowledge that you have done wrong, how can you make a change? How can you make a change? So Europe, I concentrate so much on Europe because we have very beautiful experience, we Africans with Europe, 534 years this year. And so you need to acknowledge your faults. And then when you acknowledge it, you apologize. And say, hey guys, we are sorry. We, we did it wrong. Nobody is doing that. They are saying, let us negotiate. Let us meet in different conferences that are, I, I regard them as party, you know. I wouldn't want to go to Egypt because that's not a safe, like she said before, that's not a safe space for me. I will be so triggered that I will, be, I will fall sick. You understand? So you need to apologize. For this centuries long vandalization of our environment and means of livelihood, our cultures, our identity. And when you apologize, this can also take in the form of official apologies from the government, but we need an apology from the church too. We need apologies from the corporate entities. To add to that, we also need a kind of a deep colonial and anti-racist uh, uh, curriculum in schools and other vocational institutions. That's the first step we have to make. That's the acknowledgement and assessment. The second part, the second step will be compensation, compensation and reparation. Because if you now say you are sorry, then you need to repair what you have damaged. Is possible. And if it's not possible, you need to compensate. So for loss and damage, adaptation and uh, mitigations, you know, so what we call, what you all know, climate debt, you know. So we, we, we believe that there are methods we can apply to this very important part of our demands and position. You, 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 you follow up the events in, in Egypt. You saw that this topic was very huge on the agenda. And, um, but we feel that if we first of all have to talk about lands, like Pablo said, so we need to return land to the indigenous people. This is not only about justice. This is just logical. The indigenous people protect 80% of our biodiversity, not the technology, not the white or European, uh, what do you call it, uh, progress. So if we want to make a change into, a, into a, uh, in, in this transformative change, we need to give land back to the rightful owner, to the indigenous people so that they can protect our biodiversity. Because we can, we can do that. When I say we, <laughs> I'm saying the global, no, I'm not part of that, but I just use that rhetorically, you understand? So we also need to also talk about those who are affected by this climate catastrophe, who are already affected, losing their homes, what do you do with them? People who have to leave their homes because of ecocide, because of climate change, what do you do with them? You call them economic refugees. That's, Maybe, that's, that's very sorry, Peter, yeah, sorry. Yeah, just there a question because you are, um, one question for you and then a question for Juan Pablo. Um, I'm sorry, I, I, I forgot that I have to take a break. 
No, <laughs> no, it's really interesting. Um, and yes, because you are also fighting for um, having the the Geneva Convention on Refugees changed, uh, so um, climate. Uh, disasters are actually recognized as uh, a flight reason. So maybe you can talk about more a bit um, what's your fight there and um, who is actually also against it. Because um, I think if you hear it, it should be very clear that this should be a, a legal reason to, to seek refuge, right? So um, yeah, maybe you can talk a bit about this. Okay, uh, first, the first thing we have to know is that I believe that everyone has the right not to migrate. Everyone has the right to stay at home. I, have, I had that right, I was deprived of that right, okay? So when we talk about migration or refugees or whatever, they think that people just, uh, because they want to, it's just fun leaving your home to get to places that you don't know before. Now, um, sometime last year before Glasgow, um, the United Nations, UN uh, HDR, declared that 90% of refugees worldwide come from countries that are most hit by the effects of climate change. Not 9%, 90%. Okay, if you do the mathematics in terms of Africa, you will find out that people who are recognized, Africans who are recognized as refugees here, almost about that, nine, 10% or whatever. So what do you do with the remaining 90%? These are the 90% you call economic refugees. You know, you disqualify them with that term because there is no law, there is no convention, there is no protocol that defines their status. The refugee convention regime was not actually meant for people like me from Africa. It was meant for the Europeans after the Second World War. It was created purposely to solve or to assist European refugees. So I feel that we are being tolerated in this whole process. So now after 1951 to date, there, is, there has never been any time there's been an update of this convention. And a lot of things have, have you know, we, we now have climate change. So we now have uh, discussions about ecocide, which is going to become law anyhow, you understand? So, but there is no discussion about those people who have been displaced because of these factors. Therefore, we need an update of the Geneva Convention to make it inclusive. Of course, the, the global north, they are scared about so-called exodus, you know, uh, to Europe, for instance. That, mean, that will mean everybody will come to Europe. Do you think that everybody is fucking interested in living in Europe? Do you know how many percentage of Africans migrate to Europe? Do you know how many percentage of Africans migrate within Europe? We need to take a look at that. When we have only 4% of those migrating in, U, uh, pro, with, in Afro, Africa come to Europe, and, and you think that people are really, the, every, the whole of Africa will move to, to Europe because the social system is so superb, and, and then I would, uh, no. So we need, a review of this of these protocols of this convention to make it inclusive we need what we call uh, the universal climate passport we need that universal climate passport is very fundamental if we go to the pacific 
uh, states and so much affected right now, losing lands and, and, and homes, what do you do with these people? You need to create an avenue for them to find a better, another place to continue their life, if possible. You know, that's the least that you can do. Okay, thank you, uh, Juan Pablo. I think you're still there, just without video. I hope you can hear us. Um, yeah, my question would be, because also Peter um, mentioned it, um, why, why are indigenous people so important uh, for the solutions uh, for the climate crisis? Why do, why do we need them? <clears throat> um, yeah. Yes, uh, thank you. Do you hear me? Hello, do you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Right. Thank you. So in the previous answer, I explained uh, that the climate crisis is not something independent or something consubstantial, as I said, but the result of the modern European, modern of society that, uh, that gravitates around the notion of progress, but the notion the Western notion of progress, which in reality is the alteration of the universal order of life, where the rational European man positioned himself above Mother Earth to justify his exploitation, and as well of colonialism, which justified the exploitation of the richest lands, the richest lands, which are those of the global south for the benefit of Europe supported by the theories of the thinkers of the enlightenment, as he said before. And something else that I forgot in the previous answer, which is the modern individualism, because modern European progress is justified by the notion of individual, of the ego. So uh, to begin, uh, it's important to say that indigenous peoples uh, are 4% 4, 4 of the world population today. A minority, demographically, demo, demographically speaking, that today, in 2022, have in their territories the 80% of the remaining biodiversity of the planet Earth. 4% of population are the holders of 80%, 80% of the remaining biodiversity in our planet. And if indigenous people have 80% of the biodiversity, it's not because we have been lucky enough to have the richest, last, the richest lands in the world, but because we have been able to coexist harmon harmoniously with the territories and with the lands, which has allowed to be preserved these lands in the, in the state that they are today. Because we have been able to maintain our cosmovisions, our ways of understanding life and interacting with the environment and society, that has allowed inevitably uh, those lands to, 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 be to be preserved in the way they are today. To, to this day, it has been said that the indigenous peoples are the victims of colonizations. And that's something true. Indigenous people are the historical victims of European territorial colonization. However, from my point of view, something that is not said and which is very important is that indigenous people, if we analyze the context globally, are in reality the only peoples in the world who never been colonized epistemologically. They were never colonized. No, they have been colonized territorially, but never epistemologically. That means in, in terms of thought. And that's what 
that's uh, the, the, the fact to not have been uh, colonized that allowed us to maintain our worldviews, our epistemologies outside the he hegemonic modern European worldview, which is the one that uh, governs the, the society today under the notion of progress, as I said in the first in the first part. That is to say that the indigenous, that is to say that indigenous people has never secularized nature and have always conceived the nature in the natural framework of life as the mother which make the life possible, on which we depend structurally to live, and uh, that we have therefore to, to take care and to protect. Indigenous people didn't fall into this logic of modern European life, and therefore never entered the universal order of life. They never exploited the mother, the, the mother in the way of, uh, of the modern people has done. That's why indigenous people have today the 80% of the world's remaining biodiversity. And moreover, indigenous people have never broke the natural order of men as a collective, the men as a community, contrary to modern men who conceives himself as an individual under the premise of, uh, I think, therefore I am, you know, of the father of modern philosophy called René Descartes. The indigenous people are conceived in Africa, in, in, in Asia, in South America, where I have had the, where I had the opportunity to be with another notion of I am because we are. That's from a, that's, that's the logical uh, way of life of indigenous people uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in the world. That is to say that I can't conceive myself as individual if we are not as collective. That's absolutely the contrast, the other side of the modern philosophy. So there is a big difference in the way of projecting ourselves, even in the struggle against the, against the climate crisis. Because here, even when people fight, when I say here, I say in Europe, because I am in the present time in Paris, people are trying to fight against climate climate crisis as individuals with the, with the values of, uh, of modernity. And uh, if we analyze the, the, the numbers that I, that I told you, the that 4% of the population, which are the indigenous people, today have the 80% of the world remaining biodiversity, in this context that we are living of climate crisis and global warming, that is putting the survival of the entire humanity at risk, that means that the entire humanity can still live today in this planet thanks to the existence of that 4%, that means the indigenous people. That's why, the thinking of indigenous people today more than ever is more relevant not to fight the climate crisis as everyone thinks, but to fight against the reasons that are causing the, that are causing the, the climate crisis. Today, indigenous peoples, those savages, those barbarians, those non-civilized, as they have historically been called from the European arrogance, hold today the key that could save the world from the tragedy in which we are, uh, that we are all living. Today, in 2022, considering the climate crisis that we are facing, indigenous peoples in the world 
from my point of view, have inevitably become the political subject of this century because of the strategic role they are playing right now in guaranteeing the life of the entire humanity. Thank you. Thank you, Juan Pablo. Um, well, also uh, having a look at the at the time, uh, I would uh, now ask you maybe to um, have a short conclusion um, on your points, um, as short as this is possible. I know um, for such a big to topic, um, maybe each one of you um, can say just uh, like two minutes. Um, a wrap up, maybe also if you want in regards to the COP this, that um, took place 10 days ago and um, yeah, that had like mixed uh, mixed results, let's say. So yeah, um, maybe Sheena, do you want to start? Uh, okay, poor and stuff. Um, well, generally and i think i'm repeating myself but also taking into account what um uh peter and juan pablo have been saying i think like we radical action and radical change is just required um and and i mean that in every aspect of approaching or striving for environmental justice in a very intersectional and very bold way so um, rethinking our array of life, rethinking relations, rethinking the way that we approach uh, um, political decision making, um, but also specifically this uh, discourse on on uh, environmental justice and the way that we frame the so-called uh, climate uh, crisis, or as Peter said, climate catastrophe, um, and. I would just really hope to see uh, more honesty and more more boldness in that because I'm I'm really fed up with like having having all of these big speeches and everything, but there's no action behind it. There's no and as as I think all of us have pointed out, the solutions are there. The solutions are with the people, and the solutions are specifically uh, with people in the global south, with indigenous people, with black people, and with leaders that have been leading this fight so um yeah I, I just think it's time to to leave all of these speeches that we've heard also during to bring cop cop into it uh, that we've heard um in uh, at cop 27 because it's frustrating like we've been saying we need action for decades now like it's it's really time to time to act because we're we're just running out of it and and it's not something that will happen in the future people are suffering and dying in the here and now so it's it's already too late so we really need to get started and and to to take to take more bold and radical action and i think um maybe one final sentence on on cop 27 um if i mean major disappointment um I think obviously, uh, and just because I want to honor um, the the really decade long struggle uh, from people and mainly global South activists that have really been pushing uh, to have the loss and damage agenda on the table. And that's not something that global North country, uh, countries came up with. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been really a fight from grassroots um, activism in the global South. And so I do think it's a major win that it was so prominently on the agenda and that there should be a fund, but it comes at a high cost. So we have no decision making on um on phasing out of fossil fuels, not even on phasing down and apart. And I think everyone knows that apart from the human rights situation now in Egypt, but also the situation we will have uh, for COP28 um, uh, in, in, in UAE will, will be terrible. So 
all of this. We 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 just can't have environmental justice without human rights, without um, without the protection of of environmental defenders that are targeted um, and that are threatened. So um, yeah, I'm not too optimistic, but I'm glad we had this, this uh, discussion and just can really emphasize that I think the solution is uh, uh, with the people. So we need to start acting and listening. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Ah, okay, um, thank you uh, for organizing this. I, I would just want to give uh, some demands, uh, positions, and with the hope that you are going to at least pass it on to, to Catherine. And uh, because I trust her and, um, and, and I, even when this run is so small, pass it on to her and say, this is what uh, was discussed. And uh, first of all, we from the diaspora, I call us, we from the diaspora, from the global South. And uh, we are so sidelined, if also financially, we can't even run our projects. And that is making it easier for the white folks to, um, take over everything. We, we, we can't take part in negotiations. Last time I saw the Minister of Agriculture um, calling, uh, having a meeting with uh, people, I mean, with organizations, I call them corporate NGOs in, in our field, um, uh, Umvet Hife and all the rest, you know, and there was nobody, you know, he called them, he called them Umvet Dependent. You know, the environmental um, NGOs, the main group, I think there were six of them. There was none of, none, none of these organizations were from the Global South, no representations. You know, these are the experts. But we feed these experts with information, with expertise, which they use, which they turn to their own to, be, to, to say this is their own uh, expertise that they, they, are, they, are, they, are, they are presenting to you. So what we are saying is that we need a fund. Please write it down for Catherine. We need a fund from the federal government, from the Bundestag, that black people, indigenous people, and uh, I mean, people from the global South who are mostly affected, who even have to leave their homes to come to Germany here to live and still have the courage to continue to educate you have the courage to do the job you were supposed to be doing, not me as a victim. At least, as so as a taxpayer, we need to have an equal share of the cake. We need, we need funding, that's very important. The second point is that we must be included in further negotiations. Because we live here, most of us are even Germans. We pay tax and we are more affected because we have to take care of not only of ourselves here, we have to take care of the victims at home too from our own salary. So we need that uh, support. But two points on the list will be one that we need a I just mentioned two before. Uh, the, uh, uh, I mentioned acknowledgement and assessment. I mentioned the climate reparation. Um, by the way, for this climate reparation, we also will not talk about depth for climate. Yeah, and, and you know, it was a huge topic in Egypt. And as an activist of the depth for climate uh, campaign movement, I think I, I, I feel safe to speak for, for this movement by saying that what we are saying is that we need a total and unconditional cancellation of depths of the global south. There are many reasons I could give to you today, but we don't have the time for that, but we need that now. And let us not mistake it for the depth for climate swaths of the IMF and the World Bank and other financial institutions. 
What we need are unconditional cancellation of debt. That money or funds will, will be released through that for self-determined, self-determined, not imposed solutions. Because these debts we are, are not even legitimate, at least I can talk for Africa. Most of these funds were stolen and they are in your banks today. And you are even refusing to release those funds to us. Nigeria is a special case for that. You understand? So what we are saying is unconditional cancellation of debt. We do not want to support anybody, any organization that supports these debt for climate swaps because it is poisonous for us. Anything that is being touched by IMF, World Bank, at least when it comes to colonialism, debt colonialism, financial colonialism, these are the world champions. These are our, these are our target. If we want to decolonize, we need also to, dis, to abolish these institutions. It's very clear in this new transformative uh, uh, phase. The last point is ecocide law. You know, we, we can talk about why things are like this. We can talk about history, but we need solutions. And for us, at least for me, who will be running this ecocide campaign for more than 45, about 45 years now, I can tell you that based on the fact that now that we know that it is the environment, the destruction of the environment that is being destroyed that is leading us to this or that has caused this catastrophe, we need to ban or impose or promulgate laws on international levels to prohibit the destruction of environment and of livelihood. That is the only way we can combat this, uh, this catastrophe or future catastrophe that will come because Shell, uh, uh, Siemens, or Chevron, or all these uh, environmental criminals, they will not voluntarily change. So we need some regulations that are enforceable. So, and uh, I would might say that uh, I've forgotten her name now, but this little girl in Egypt, uh, 10 years old girl who made this beautiful speech uh, during the conference. I forgotten the name now, 10 years girl, uh, old girl from, from Ghana. Uh, I want to conclude by her words, using her words, because I find it very, very, uh, fantastic uh, with that courage at that age to challenge the power that be uh, by saying, uh, if I quote her rightly, uh, when can you pay us back? Because payment is overdue. That's my final word. Thank you. And uh, Juan Pablo, um, I'm sorry, but I think it has to be really short. We are already <laughs> a bit over time. <laughs> Pablo, sorry to steal your time. No. So <laughs> the, the balance of this COP, uh, from my point of view, is uh, quite disheartening. Because as I said in the first question, the climate crisis is being taken like something consubstantial. People are talking about the consequences of the crisis, but they don't talk about the causes that are pro that are provoking it. It's like, uh, for example, like a smoker thinking about how he's going to treat lung cancer, and not about how he's going to try to stop smoking in order to avoid the lung cancer. That's what's happening in, in the cops. Everyone talks about climate crisis, but very few talk about colonialism. Everyone talks about global warming, but no one talks about the market. 
Everyone talks about climate justice, but no one talks about capital. So I feel that these codes are not being used for the purpose for which they were created. Normally the goal of those events were to find a solution to the climate crisis, to see how to mitigate. But in reality, it's an event where the presidents of the world go to give a speech to talk nice, most of them uh, repeating what they said in the previous COP. The COPs are speeches, are theories, but nothing are practical. I realized in this COP in, in Egypt that there are a lot of talk. Everything is talked about except what should be talked about in reality, which are the causes that are provoking the climate crisis. In other words, the market capitalism and the, and the, and the economy. So if, if in an event like the COP, there is no people talking about colonialism, market, economy or the capital, if people are not talking about the culprits that are causing the climate crisis, that means that the cops are a uh, disrespect for the humanity. It's like a circus. I think that the word to, to, to talk about is like a circus to distract the public opinion because it's absolutely useless to talk about the urgency of the climate crisis if in reality we don't fight against the market, the capital, and the colonialism. One of the positive balances of the COP was to reach the agreement for the creation of the loss and damage fund to help the developing uh, countries affected for the consequences of the climate crisis, as Pakistan, for example. That was one of the most relevant victories of the COP27. But however, when you look at this bottom line, it's a measure that, again, is still focused in dealing with the consequences of climate crisis and not the reasons that are causing that. So for me, the COP will be a success, and I will finish with that. The COP will be a really success when we start talking about the new paradigms of progress, new alternatives to the market economy, when it's accepted that capitalism and colonialism are the reasons that have engendered that crisis and therefore it's time to fight without clemency. Otherwise it's a circus like today. And finally, for me the COP will begin to, to be worthwhile when all the indigenous people from, from Asia, from Africa, from South America, will be in the official photo of the COP as the current holders of the 80% of the world remaining biodiversity and not as today the photo with the responsibles with the responsibles of the tragedy that we are living. When the COP decolonize the agenda, when things will start to be redefined and when we will start to, to, to look at the reality in front of us without uh, fear, uh, I think that the COP uh, will be worthwhile, but it's not the case in, in the moment. Otherwise, the COP will, be, will keep being a technocrat technocratic space where thousands, thousands of peoples believe that they are saving the world going to make networking and take on, taking photos for Instagram, while the culprits, while the resp responsibles of the, problem, of the problem are taking the solution behind the, the, the door, the, the closed door. Uh, that's my conclusion. Well, thank you so much uh, to the three of you. Um, that was really, really interesting. Um, I hope um, it was also interesting for you guys. Um, and I would say that um, having the uh, taking the time into account, I would leave the Q and A uh, now out, and I would say uh, we finish here. But thank you so much for participating and being here and sharing your. Um, perspectives with us. Um, yeah, as mentioned, I will send you the link later and uh, thank you so much. Peter and China, a big hug and thank you, thank you very much.
Yes, Thank have you. back. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Bye. 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 Bye.